Hello chess fans, in this video we're going to see the great Paul Karras uh, show us incredible defensive technique. Hey guys, uh, this is Brian Castro with Better Chess Training and uh, the game I want to show you is uh, Ludwig Prinz uh, versus Paul Karras, uh, Zanvoort 1936. And uh, this is a little bit different than some of the games uh, that I've shown. It's not the most well-known game, um, but uh, the players are the players are fairly well known and famous. But uh, the game itself is not a classic game, but it is a very good game, and it and it, and it illustrates a few things, particularly on the defensive end. So that's why I wanted to show it to you. So let's get started, and. Here we have uh, uh, Karras was uh, the black pieces, and Prince was the white pieces. Uh, some of you may uh, have heard of the Prince variation of the Sicilian defense, and that's where uh, he got his name from. He is a international master. Actually, he's a grandmaster uh, from a uh, Dutch grandmaster, but he was an international master at the time that this game was played. Uh, and Paul Karras, as uh, many may know, was uh, one of the strongest players ever and perhaps the strongest player to never win the world championship. Or at least that's up for debate. Uh, but he's uh, he was a championship contender in the uh, con candidates tournaments uh, several times and came up short uh, several times. But in any case, uh, here is a nice game. And let's take a look. D4, knight to F6. Knight to f3, e6, e3, d5, and bishop to d3. And here we have a uh, Kali system. And uh, club players and amateurs may know this uh, fairly well. It's been a favorite. And it's recently found its way into the repertoire of our world champion, Magnus Carlsen, who has played it uh, actually in world championship matches as well as in tournaments. So it is uh, now getting a little more um, high-level High level uh, respect, I guess you could say. Uh, C5, this is one of the main moves against the Kali to um, counterattack against the center. C3, and the idea here is that if uh, black were to push uh, C4, which would not be a great move, uh, black could just drop back his bishop here. Knight B to D7. Uh, the other main move here is knight to c6 or bishop to d6 okay but uh, knight b d7 castle bishop to d6 knight b d2 castle queen to e2 and the idea behind this is that uh, white wants to push this uh, e4 to uh, free his game and to create an initiative here. Queen to c7. e4, and here's that, uh, that e4 break. c takes d4, so this is one of the ways to uh, play against it. Um, and the idea here is that black is now going to force a, an isolated pawn on white. And c takes d4. Now, just a couple things to note here. Um, if you try to push e5, then knight takes e5, knight takes e5, bishop takes e5, c takes d4, and bishop to d4, and black would be up two pawns, uh, so that would be a mistake. And if e takes d5 instead, then d takes c3, b takes c3, knight takes d5, and then if um, white tried to get fancy with uh, bishop takes h7 check, king to h7, knight to g5 check, king to g8, queen to h5, then we could simply bring our other knight in to protect here. So uh, black uh, would be winning in this case. So um, white uh, playing c takes d4, uh, probably the best move here. d takes e4, knight takes e4. So this is all actually pretty standard. Um, the white isolated pawn sometimes get a, b a bad rap, but there are some positive features, and so we always have to understand that when we have something that is typically a pawn weakness, 
there are oftentimes uh, counterbalances or uh, positive imbalances that are created by it. For example, here white has more space and also white hat will have a, a nice uh, outpost for his e5, uh, on e5 for his knight. And we have the open c file which white can also uh, occupy and we'll see a little bit of this in the game as well. However, um, as the game goes on this this uh, isolated pawn can by, be a liability as well, especially as pieces get traded down. Bishop to f4. So this is a, uh, a subtle positional move. The question here is if white's dark square bishop is more useful for white than black's dark square bishop is for black. Uh, I think the key behind this move is that it, um, because white has an isolated pawn, uh, black wants to eliminate one of the main defenders of that pawn, which would be the dark square bishop. Okay, white plays uh, g3. Okay, and actually I saw, looking up this game, uh, the only other high-level game uh, with this position uh, went bishop to e3 instead. And then after knight takes e4, bishop takes e4, knight to f6, and rook a to c1, and queen to d6, um, the game uh, was fairly level, but uh, black went on to win a little later. Although black uh, black was about 2,600, 2,500, and uh, white was about uh, 2,350 or so in terms of rating. And that was uh, Boric uh, versus Lau in uh, Delmenhorst München in 1992. So a little more recent game there. Anyways, let's go back to the current game. Uh, G3 was played. And that is just fine for black because he captures on c1. And then rook f takes c1. So he's taking the c file. And then black plays queen to b6. Okay, putting pressure on this pawn as well as a little, you know, could also put some pressure on the b2 pawn. Knight to e5. So this is one of the, again, one of the advantages of having this. Of course, uh, black would not want to capture here uh, because. Um, it fixes this uh, fixes the problem with the isolated pawn as well as uh, this wedge or taking up the spot on e5 and driving away a uh, key defender for black. Okay, so um, instead black plays knight takes e4 and then queen takes e4. So again, we're now we're threatening mate on h7. Black uh, defends simply with knight to f6. And then queen to h4, keeping an eye on this this uh, h7 square. Okay, uh, rook to d8, and here we're putting pressure here. Now we have two attackers on this d4 pawn and just one defender. So white blocks. Well, he does a couple things here. He blocks the uh, queen from being able to attack this pawn, and he also sets up to double rooks. On the C file, as well as uh, one of the ways that uh, people who possess the isolated queen's pawn uh, use it is sometimes to advance it and to uh, cause some tactical complications here. So it helps to support that idea later on, but that's more of a long term idea. Okay, uh, let's actually go back a couple moves. There's a couple, um, something I wanted to note. After uh, queen to h4, instead of rook to d8, you, some of you might have been wondering, well, can we take queen takes b2? And the problem here is knight to g4. And actually, this is a, a good pattern to learn because uh, it happens in a lot of different openings where there is this attack on h7. Okay, so this can is used to distract this piece um, or to deflect it. Of course, we cannot take it because of checkmate. And it's very difficult to defend here. Uh, if h6, then uh, knight takes f6, g takes f6, and then uh, queen takes f6. And it does not look good for black here. Okay, so that's one reason why um, that's why we would not take the um, pawn on b2. Okay, let's go back to the game here. Uh, black did play rook to d8, rook to c5. Now h6, so that kind of helps to get rid of that. So now, um, you know, now we can see that um, oh, 
sorry. Now we see that uh, B2 is now, uh, has the potential to be captured. So white plays B3 here. Um, and according to some analysis I did, uh, some of it using the engine, some of it not. Um, not quite the best move. Not a bad move, but because we did have, you know, white had to take it. But in this type of position where white has uh, the initiative, where white is kind of controlling the tempo of the game, uh, it's important to look for ways to continue with that initiative. And, and a couple moves uh, that I saw, or one, one variation that I saw, would be something like knight to c4, uh, pressuring the queen here. And then I have uh, queen to b4, and bishop to c2. So now we are, uh, if you could see this, we're starting to cut off the squares that the uh, queen can go to. Rook to d5, trying to uh, counterattack, and then a3. Okay, and then um, actually this one is, I uh, give credit to my uh, chess engine to help me with this one. Now we have an interesting, um, interesting material imbalance after rook takes c5, a takes b4, rook takes c4, bishop to d3, and rook takes b4. So we gave up our uh, queen for a minor piece, a rook, and a pawn. So points-wise, it's about equal. Um, I think white has a little bit of the better of it because he has a better development. This rook has an open file or a half-open file, and uh, white is still bearing down on uh, black's king. But um, definitely not... Um, losing for black, but it's uh, definitely a way that white could have gone. Very complicated, though, so uh, again, using the chess engine to help me, but uh, let's go back. Okay, white played b3 instead. Um, problem here, again, is, is that uh, white should try to keep the initiative, because the more, if black can, can wrestle the initiative away from white and uh, take control himself, white's weakness particular here, this uh, d4 pawn will start to um, come to light. And this is where uh, Karras does well, because uh, his defensive skills in terms of, he has to be very accurate as well, because white at the moment does have the initiative, does have the pressure, and has a little bit of an attack. So uh, black has to defend well. So after b3, queen to d6. Okay, so now, again, we're pinpointing this uh, target here. And also, uh, these pieces have to be careful because if something happens to this pawn, both of these pieces would now be hanging. Okay. Rook A to C1, doubling up here. Now we see there, there are some threats here getting onto the seventh rank. Uh, we see here that F7 can become a target. Okay. And. Okay, we see that white has doubled rooks here on the C file. And uh, black is behind in development. And. What Karras does, he stays calm, and he simply develops uh, his, his piece that he can develop, his worst piece right now, with bishop to d7. Okay, it's not a spectacular move, but it solves black's development problem, because it frees now uh, this rook, as well as um, partially negating the power of white's doubled rooks, okay, because it, it, now it's kind of blocking up the seventh rank here. Uh, not Remember, every exchange, so if white were to exchange this bishop, which isn't a great bishop anyway because it's not really active at the moment. Uh, every exchange brings black closer to an advantageous endgame with this better pawn structure. Okay. Uh, by the way, it would have been a mistake for black to take on d4 because after queen takes d4, rook takes d4, um, white has rook takes c8 check and then rook to d8. Obviously, is forced to avoid uh, an eventual checkmate. And then rook takes a8, rook takes a8, and then rook to c7. And we can see, uh, besides being ahead in material uh, slightly, um, white's rook is uh, dominating here, and white is going to win more material. Okay? Okay, let's go back. After bishop to d7. Okay, now knight to c4. Okay? Uh, queen to f8. g4. Okay, so white is trying to keep that pressure going on the king side. And we can see this rook can swing over at some point. So white is still, uh, black is defending very well, but white uh, obviously still has a lot of uh, play left in this game. Okay, knight to d5. Okay, 
Okay, and that comes back to e5. And now black makes another, again, another subtle uh, defensive move, uh, which I think is um, hard to understand. And I, I looked at this position for a while to see how the reasoning behind this. And what black plays here is b6. Okay, so what's so great about b6? I think part of it is that we're kicking this pawn off of uh, c5, where it has access to the fifth rank. And black's going to have an easier time uh, attacking uh, d, d4 as well. Partly because the rook is not there to support this d4 to d5 push after now that it's being attacked. Um, so white won't be able to get rid of this uh, weakness so easily. And another um, reason, and I got this through doing some analysis, is that at some point, this pawn, if it stayed on b7, would, in some variations, uh, become a target itself. So let me give you an example. If instead of b6, um, black were to, say, play knight to f4 to maybe uh, you know, try to get some counterplay, then a variation could go queen to g3, knight takes d3, queen takes d3, bishop to e8 to uh, protect f7 and to get this bishop from uh, getting exchanged, as well as opening this file. Queen to e4, and now we can see here this pawn is starting to be targeted. Queen to d6, queen takes b7, queen takes d4. Now, even though the material is even, you can see here white has gotten rid of his only weakness, his pawn weakness, and now has a queenside majority, which will give him uh, you know, something to look forward to in the end game. Okay, so let's head back. So that's why uh, Kyrus play, uh, wisely played b6. Okay, rook to c7. And here white ex sacrifices the exchange. Um, I think the idea here is that this knight is very well posted here on d5. Can it be attacked by pawns? Kind of looking over some of the key uh, dark squares, especially since, um, since uh, white cannot contend it or contend against those squares with its dark square bishop, which was exchanged earlier. Okay, so uh, white instead, white instead um, decides to try to uh, threaten to go onto the seventh rank here and sacrifice the exchange. If um, white tried to do something else, then uh, it looks pretty good for. For black. So let me give you some examples. For example, if uh, white were to back this rook up here, then bishop to b5, rook 4 to c2, bishop takes d3, knight takes d3, and then here, knight to b4, uh, threatening to exchange here, um, favors black because of this, this weakness here, which would be, uh, this pawn would be lost fairly soon. Okay? Um, Another option would be, let's go back here. Another option would be just dropping back to c2, after which uh, knight to b4, rook to d2 to avoid losing the exchange. Knight takes d3, rook takes d3, and then bishop to b5, rook d to d1, rook a to c8. And now again, after a series of ch exchanges, we have a, a better endgame for black because of this weakness, and also this bishop will... Uh, be better than this knight with pawns on both sides of the board. Okay, well instead of rook to c7, uh, white could have, um, instead of sacrificing the exchange on c7, uh, I was looking at taking here on d5 right away. e takes d5, g5, and then maybe queen to d6 to bring this queen back out to defend. And I think this might have been a better way to sacrifice the exchange because now uh, the pawns are equivalent. The pawn structure is more symmetrical, and white still maintains some initiative with uh, a little bit of um, an attack on black's king. So I think this might have been a little bit better um, way to have done it. Okay, let's go back to the game. Rook to c7. Knight takes c7. Rook takes c7. So he sacrificed the exchange, but now he's got a rook here on the seventh rank. Makes another and again, very accurate defensive move here. Bishop to e8, okay, protecting the f7 pawn here. Okay, white pushes on with g5. 
and black plays another active move, queen to d6, okay, targeting uh, this rook here as well as the d4 pawn. Then white retreats to protect the d4 pawn. And then another excellent move, queen takes e7. Or I'm sorry, queen to e7, pinning the g pawn so that uh, he can't take right away. Knight to f3, protecting the queen, so now uh, he can capture if he wants to. And again, so when you're defending, you need to be very active in defense and trying to counterattack, trying to create threats, and we can see how Karras has done that throughout this game. The other thing that you want to do, if this is the case, is you want to bring all of your pieces, just like you want to bring all of your pieces to attack, you also want to uh, bring in all of your pieces to defend here. And so he makes another excellent positional move, rook a to c8. Let's take a look at what is happening here. The idea is that black's king is temporarily safe uh, because of this pin here. Uh, and black's going to take a moment to activate the only piece that wasn't doing anything useful, which is this was the a8 rook. And he does it by trading it which, with the much more useful rook here on c4. And this is basically what we want to do when we're, when we're defending is a trade, well, and a lot of times we want to trade our not so good pieces with our opponent's um, active pieces, okay? And also we're going to find out, uh, and remember too, uh, that black is up the exchange. So by doing this, he's getting closer to an end game where his extra material will, will uh, be felt, okay? So queen to e4, okay, renewing this threat now on h7. So black plays g6, blocking uh, the diagonal. G takes h6, rook takes c4, bishop or b takes c4. So now he's got hanging pawns, which is a little bit better than the isolated pawn. And now again, black Kyrus makes an excellent move here, queen to f6. Okay, putting pressure on the d4 pawn as well as uh, stopping any threats of. Um, something like queen to e5 to attack the g7 square. Okay, white plays h4, desperately trying to pry open the king side with whatever he's got left here. Um, otherwise, remember, he's down material now. So if we go into an end game, it's, it's pretty much going to be curtains, especially against someone like uh, Kyrus, who is obviously one of the best players in the world. Okay, queen to f5. So now Kyrus is definitely going for an end game. Queen takes f5, now g takes f5. Okay, this is much better than e takes f5. Actually, they're both fine, uh, probably both winning, but here the idea is that he wants to deny uh, white to have any pass pawns or any type of counterplay. So going back, g takes f5. Notice that these pawns, um, even though they're, they're this is technically a pass pawn, he's going to lose it pretty soon. Okay. D5, trying to break up these pawns. King to H7. Okay, uh, Black can take his time, or not take his time, but he can stay calm here because obviously if he can, uh, this pawn, the E pawn is pinned here because of this uh, bishop. Okay, knight to uh, E5, trying to get some activity as well as protecting the bishop. And F6, kicking the knight out. Um, just note here, e takes d5 is also fine. Bishop takes uh, f5 check, king takes h6, c takes d5, rook takes d5, okay. Um, skewering the pieces, knight to g4 uh, check, and then king to g7, bishop to e4, and rook to h5 is winning as well. Okay, going back to the game, f6, knight to f3, e takes d5, Bishop takes f5 check, king to h6. Okay, so now notice we, the exchange of pawns here. C takes d5, rook takes d5, bishop to e6. And now um, it's pretty much over, and Kyrus is going to put it away with a few very accurate moves here. Rook to d1 check, king to h2, 
Bishop to c6, attacking an f3 pawn, but also putting it in position for his next move. Knight to g1, and finally, bishop to d5, uh, threatening this bishop as well as this pawn. He's going to either win another pawn or trade down even further. So uh, with that in mind, uh, white resigned. Okay, uh, going over uh, just a couple instructive points in this game. We remember here that white has uh, a lot of the initiative and has an attack going and black um, of course had to calculate this had to be very accurate and uses his time to develop his remaining pieces so that he can use them to defend and so in this position for example he plays very accurate not a very spectacular move but uh, bishop to d7 and then from here he's able to mount his defense um, against white and get his pieces uh, very active. And in this in this position, uh, black plays the uh, very tactical uh, uh, queen to e7, pinning this pawn and slowing up white's uh, pressure. And, then... and finally, just want to review this next move which is rook a to c8. And the idea here, of course, uh, with this uh, king being fairly safe, we want to take our worst piece and activate it. And in this case, we, we could also trade it down with white, one of white's, uh, actually all of white's pieces are fairly active, so trading it with his good rook here. And in that way, black is continuing to trade down into a superior endgame. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please press the like button and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Also, let me know which players are your favorite, which games you'd like me to uh, review. I definitely enjoy our conversations and I use your input to decide which games to uh, review in the future. So uh, put your thoughts in the comments and let's start a conversation. Talk to you soon.